working in Earth and Environmental Sciences and Biology, Health, and Society at the University of Michigan. Uh, I serve as the ecology team lead for the organization. I kind of oversee all of the living aspects of our system. So the plants, the fish, the bacteria that make them work and live and grow together successfully. Uh, that's kind of what I'm in charge of and researching. Um, and I originally joined the club because I was very interested in water conservation and aquatic ecosystems in general and how to help preserve those. And aquaponics helps with those and we will tell you how in a few slides. <laughs> Um, hello everyone, my name is Brianna Roost. I will be co-presenting with Ben. Um, I'm a junior majoring in material science and engineering and minoring in electrical engineering. And I'm the technology team lead for Michigan Aquaponics. Um, and I've been on the team about two years, but with my responsibilities as the tech team lead, I'm kind of educating new members about the systems as well as just supervising um, all of our systems and making sure that they're built um, to a standard that works and problem solving anything that goes wrong with that. All right, so some of you might be wondering what is aquaponics? Uh, it's the cultivation of fish and plants together in a constructed recirculating ecosystem utilizing natural bacterial cycles to convert fish waste to plant nutrients. Basically what that means is the water is cycled in a closed loop between a plant bed and a fish tank. And these two units mutually benefit each other to produce growing fish and plants for harvest. Uh, these systems tend to be very environment environmentally friendly, uh, whether it be from the recycled materials used to build the systems or the reduction in water usage that we will discuss right now. So aquaponics is important and relevant to our world today because we are experiencing a water crisis. As you may have heard in the news, many regions are undergoing huge, very severe droughts such as California due to climate change and all sorts of other factors. And the human population is increasing and we only have a limited amount of fresh water, only so much to go around. And it is a fact that one of our greatest uses of fresh water is agriculture and the growing of food comprising over 70% of our species water usage. And just in the US alone, the USDA estimates that 80% of our fresh water goes towards agriculture. That's an incredible amount. And aquaponics combats this because it can use up to 90% less water than traditional farming methods. And this takes place in two ways. Number one, the uh, continual recycling and reuse of the water makes it so you only have to top the system up, you know, add it every few days, weeks, depending on the size of the system. Uh, whereas traditional farming, you're just letting the water, once it hits the soil, it's soaking down, down, down into the groundwater. And you're losing that for what could have been going to the plant roots. And on top of that, many aquaponic systems have some sort of cover on the fish tank or the plant bed. And that results in a reduction in evaporation, retaining a lot of that water and making so less is used overall. Uh, so these are just some diagrams of some systems that kind of the three big types, I'd say, the three archetype systems. On the left, you have a media bed. And this is basically the closest thing you'll get to a normal garden, I'd say. Uh, you have media. Uh, some sort of gravel. We use hydrogen, which are these clay balls, or uh, coconut fibers are sometimes used, and plant roots sit in that media. Water is pumped from the fish tank into that plant bed, and then it cycles back into the fish tank after the plants get the water. Uh, at the top of your screen, you see a nutrient film system. What that does is it runs a very small amount of water right at the bottom of the plant roots, just so they're dipping into it. A huge benefit of this system is because the plant roots are exposed to air, it avoids root rot, a problem you may have had in your garden if there was a huge amount of rain or someone taking care of your garden left the sprinkler on. You know, you get all that hydration in the soil and then you get fungus. And that's very bad for the plants. It instantly kills them. Not instantly, but very quickly. Uh, this kind of system combats against that because of the small amount of water. And on the right, you have a deep water culture bed uh, and that is where the plants sit in a floating raft of sorts. 
and their roots just dangle in the water. Uh, this is very good for water usage because you obviously have a cover for most parts of the system. So it cuts down on evaporation a lot, but a downside is root rot. So people who run these sort of systems have to make sure that even though the water is very deep, it's continuously flowing and it's well oxygenated. So large scale systems are something newer we're seeing in agriculture. And due to the large amount of water saved, some farmers have decided to give aquaponics a try in the industrial setting. These farms are able to utilize space better, allowing for more plant growth per acre. And it also allows for indoor growing during all seasons and areas and climates where traditional agriculture is not plausible, such as Michigan. Look out your window, we got plenty of snow, at least where I'm at. Uh, this makes fresh organic produce available in local areas and cuts down on transportation costs financially and environmentally using less gas. So this is just one example of one of these and is very close to home for many of us, uh, the Great Lakes Aquaponics in Royal Oak, Michigan. Uh, they focus on plant farming of aquaponics, uh, meaning they have a lower fish load. They're not so much focused on selling and harvesting the fish. Uh, and something I really like about these systems is they use local fish as opposed to tilapia. And tilapia are a cichlid that is very commonly used in more southern operations because of the temperature requirement. Because they're up here, they're using largemouth bass, bluegill, rainbow trout, species you can use in aquaponics, but just aren't as commonly found. And it's really nice that they're using these fish right out of the Great Lakes. Uh, they use outdoor greenhouse systems that are used year round so they can grow all the time and the systems support anywhere from 600 to 1,000 plants. So this is a larger operation, and this doesn't have to be inside because it is in the wonderful, wonderful weather of Hawaii. The farm is food safety certified, so they have very, very high quality of produce. They have 20 grow bed troughs on one acre of land, and each trough yields 1,600 to 3,300 plants. So I, an incredible amount of output and it's very, very land efficient too. And that's something important considering where this is taking place. You know, Hawaii is an island. They're not gonna have more land. So land usage in an environment like that is incredibly important. And systems like this take advantage of that and help people be more efficient with their resources. Okay, I'm gonna take over now talking about uh, small scale aquaponic systems. Um, these are systems that our club personally has more experience with, um, just as we don't have the time or resources to make systems on a commercial scale. Um, but these small scale systems can also be a good source of food locally just for your household, or maybe you wanna grow some lettuce and give it to some friends. Um, but it's a really cool system to make that utilizes the fish and the plants and it's kind of fun um, to work with it. Um, and it's a lot easier to maintain in some ways as there's not as much um, care given to the plants in terms of like dealing with the soil and the uh, composting and other aspects like that. Um, oh. Um, so going through, I want to go through some of our systems that we've built. Um, and so the first system that we've built is a baroponic system, which is a common uh, sort of system that you see if you're looking to use recycled material and just an easy system to build um, for a small media bed system in your home. We have our beta system, which is shown in the bottom left, and that's our biggest system that we've made. And it's kind of mimicking what you might see in a more commercial setting, um, but scaled down a lot um, for our purposes. And then we have had some experience with partnering with local high schools and doing educational outreach through that. And this is really good because it lets the kids at the high schools um, experiment with different aspects of our systems and learn more about the nitrogen cycle and how it applies in industry and the natural world. Um, and then additionally, we have a system that we made for Growing Hope. Uh, Growing Hope is a local nonprofit in our area that does a lot of work with um, 
food outreach and food sourcing. And so we made them a system to kind of educate uh, others about um, aquaponics and its benefits. So going a little bit more in depth about our systems, uh, the baroponics system uh, is made by using a reclaimed uh, 55 gallon plastic drum. And this is, it's a drum typically used to store chemicals, um, but we clean them and we repurpose them into aquaponic systems, uh, which is something that's really cool about these backyard um, kind of aquaponic systems that you can make yourself is that you can reuse a lot of materials and source it into something that you can use to grow plants. Um, so what we do is we cut off the top half of the uh, plastic drum and we flip it over and it creates a bucket um, that turns into the plant bed. And then we fill the plant bed with media and we can grow the plants there. Uh, in the bottom of the bucket, uh, we have the fish tank and that's where the fish live. And then we pump water from the fish tank into the media bed. And then that drains back down into the fish tank through the use of a siphon. And we've been using this system in particular just for some educational outreach within our community, um, trying to get it set up with some uh, community housing in the area, just to give them the opportunity to grow plants and kind of interact with the barrel and uh, just learn more about aquabox. Uh, going back to our biggest system, our beta system, it's a large uh, deep water culture system. It holds a total of 500 gallons of water um, between the plant bed and the fish tank. Um, so if you kind of look at the picture on the bottom right, uh, you can see in the left corner of the picture, there's a large blue square looking thing. Um, that's our fish tank. Um, which cycles into our mechanical filter and then to our biological filter and then back to the plant bed. Uh, this is our only system where we have an external mechanical filter and a biological filter. Um, and these are really important only for when you have a bigger system. Uh, the mechanical filter we have for this one is a radial filter and it kind of uses gravity um, to filter out the solid waste in the system. And the solid waste uh, can come from uh, excess fish food or fish poop that doesn't get um, converted into ammonia as quickly. And that can decompose in the system and cause harm to the uh, plants and fish. Uh, so the mechanical filter really helps with filtering that out of the system. And then our biological filter is also external in the system and it just creates a lot of surface area for the bacteria that the system needs uh, in order to operate. Um, but for the beta system, we used a one-to-one -one ratio between the plant bed and the fish tank um, in order to maintain good nutrient flow in the system as well as keep our flow rates even. Uh, going on to our high school outreach. Um, this right here is a system that we built specifically for the high school uh, based on some requirements that they wanted um, with it being a smaller scale system and then also being able to um, have it be a modular system that you can kind of take apart and look at and look at each like individual piece and say, um, how can you make modifications to it? What changes can you make? And just giving the high schoolers the chance to work with that and be able to change the system slightly. Um, but it's a nutrient flow technique system uh, with some vertical uh, grow mediums. The plants actually sit in the holes on the PVC piping that you see there in a little plant cup and then the water flows down uh, through the pipe and into the fish tank and then gets pumped back up. And you can see in this system, we actually have a split water flow going to each of the pipes. And we did educational outreach with this system 
um, through Ypsilanti Community High School and Huron High School. Um, one of the more recent projects we were working on was Growing Hope. Um, and like I said, they're a nonprofit um, over in Ypsilanti and they are working with education in the community about different methods of growing food. Um, so some design requirements we had from them when building the system uh, were that they wanted it to be a small but scalable system, um, low maintenance, and then they wanted to be able to incorporate some educational signage on it. Um, so for this, we used a nutrient film technique again, um, but in this case, we were working more with the space that we had, and which is kind of why we chose the NFT system, is because with the NFT systems, you can make it a vertical system, which is a really cool way of saving space, which is one of um, the main things that aquaponics can do for, as opposed to like traditional agriculture. And so for this, we made um, the kind of piping um, and the water gets pumped from the fish tank, which you can see in the left picture, and it gets pumped up to the top of the system and then it runs down on both sides uh, and back into the uh, fish tank. And again, the plants just sit in cups on the holes in the piping there. Um, so with that, I hope that maybe uh, some of you might be interested in making your own aquaponic systems. Maybe some of you already have, but I personally think it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool way of growing plants. Um, and aquaponic systems are very versatile and you can make them out of not quite anything, but almost anything. Um, and the main components you need for the system are a tank for the fish, a grow bed, um, fish and plants, obviously. And then you're also gonna want some sort of filtration. Um, if you wanna build a bigger system, you're gonna wanna have more of a focus on filtration but smaller systems, uh, you can kind of get away with a little bit less in terms of filtration. And then you're gonna need a water pump uh, to pump the water throughout the system. And how you wanna combine these components um, is largely up to you, uh, how you wanna design the system, how, which kind of system you want. Um, I will say there are pre-made systems if you just wanna buy one and work with it in that way. But personally, I think that it's a really fun process being able to design it and uh, implement things that you wanna see in the system and just being able to work with it and troubleshoot in that way is a really fun experience. Um, so going into building your system, you might be wondering uh, which system is best um, ben earlier mentioned that there are three types of systems and we've kind of been talking about them. Um, but just to go over that more, uh, there's a nutrient film technique, uh, the media bed system and a deep water culture, which uh, might be somewhat misleading in that you're not having a extremely deep water system, but your system is floating on a tank of water. Um, but going back into it with nutrient film technique, um, it's a good system, as Ben previously mentioned, because the roots aren't completely submerged in water. Um, so that helps with the root rot. Um, and the systems are very versatile and space efficient, uh, which is my favorite thing about nutrient film technique, is just how you can make the system vertical to hold more plants. And that could be good if you don't have a lot of space in your house, but you're still looking to build the system. Uh, some of the cons of the NFT systems are that it clogs more easily um, because there's only a thin film of water running at the bottom of the pipes. Um, so it doesn't take a whole lot of solid waste to block that up and cause issues in your system. Um, as well as there being a slightly lower nutrient uptake just in that the roots aren't completely submerged like they are in other systems. Um, 
but it's still a great system um, that I highly recommend. Uh, media event systems. Um, one of the pros about this system that I particularly like is you can make it a flood and drain system. And you do this by adding a siphon, which I'll talk more about later. Um, but that's really good if you want more variety in the plants that you can grow. Um, just because working with some of the other systems, you're gonna wanna grow plants that are more uh, interested in water, so to speak. Um, so lettuce, leafy greens are good things to grow in a deep water culture system because the roots are submerged in water the entire time and they do really well in that system. Uh, but with a media bed system, you have a little bit more opportunity for other plants and the media that you use in the system um, gives more structure for the plant roots. So the plants have more support in that way. So it's a good versatile system. Uh, some of the cons about it is that you get solid waste buildup in the systems, uh, not in the same way as the NFT systems, but just with the media, you have more solid particles moving around and they build up. Um, so it can be good to clean those systems if you have it every once in a while. And they're not a very scalable system. Um, the two systems you're more likely to see on a commercial setting are the NFT systems or the DWC systems. Um, but with a media bed system, it's hard to scale it just because it's a lot of media and adding more media, it gets heavier and just it's not good commercially, but it can be good for a small at home system. Uh, going into deep water culture systems, um, these are easy to scale. So if you do want a bigger system, uh, this could be a good option. Um, and they have a large volume of water in them, which makes it resistant to changes in pH and different nutrient levels, uh, which is good. So you don't have any sharp changes that's affecting your plants and fish. Um, the cons of this system are that root rot uh, can happen if you don't have proper aeration in the system. And you can have aeration in the system um, just by introducing um, a source, a waterfall, like when water drains into a different tank from a height, um, it can cause dissolved oxygen to get back into the system, as well as um, you can actually add air stones, which uh, add dissolved oxygen into the system if you have issues in that sense. Um, another kind of the system is that it doesn't have support for large plants. Uh, just because the roots are just in a cup hanging into the water, there's not a lot of stability in that sense. So the main plants grown in the system are, again, like I said, lettuce, uh, leafy greens, stuff like that. Um, so once you decide which kind of system you're looking at making, uh, one of the things you want to consider is filtration. Uh, there are two types of filtration that I mentioned, uh, that being mechanical filtration and then biological filtration. So for mechanical filtration, um, in a perfect system, you don't or you wouldn't need a mechanical filter. Um, and this is because all the uh, fish waste would get consumed and the fish would eat all their food, there wouldn't be any solid waste. Um, but in reality, you do get excess fish food um, and other sort of organic uh, waste products that can decompose in the system or clog pipes, which is something you do not want. Um, so depending on the size of your system, you might wanna add an external a mechanical filter like we did with our beta. Uh, the picture on the right is an image of uh, the filter we made for the beta system, that being the radial filter, uh, where water comes in and then you kind of use gravity to settle the, um, the waste to the bottom of the tank, whereas the clean water flows out of the system. Um, so, and different, filters with that. There's swirl filters, radial, 
uh, raft filters, clarifiers um, that you can look more into if you're interested in a bigger system. Uh, but for a small household system, uh, often a good way to filter it is just having a small piece of like a, a little foamy mesh um, that you put in front of a water source and that kind of blocks uh, solid waste from getting through, it collects on the foam and then you can just wash that off as needed. Going into biological filtration. Uh, it needs to go to the table, but it outlines exactly what. I'm sorry, I, could you repeat that? You're breaking up a little bit. I don't think that was an intended question. Just oh, OK. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, going on then, uh, we have biological filtration. Um, and this is more just a place for bacteria to grow. The bacteria are a really important part of the system, uh, converting the ammonia in the fish waste into nitrates and nitrites um, that the plants use. Um, but if you have a media-based system, uh, the media can be a good place for the bacteria to grow uh, as they act act as a extra surface area. Um, but for the other types of the systems, you're gonna wanna add some sort of um, surface area for the bacteria to grow. Uh, and one way, good way to do this is with bioballs. And there's a picture of them on the slide. Um, they're just little plastic balls um, that provide a lot of surface area for the bacteria to colonize on. Um, one of my favorite parts of aquaponics uh, are siphons, which I think are a very, very neat little uh, device. And you use these mostly with the media systems as well. Um, so what a siphon does is it transports water from a high area to a low area. Um, but it does this in a flood and drain type of way. Um, so if you look at the um, picture I have down below, uh, the blue is the water in a system and the red is the siphon. And what happens is that once the water hits the highest point in the siphon, um, the siphon creates kind of a lock and it activates and it drags the water from uh, the media bed, in this case, down into the fish bed um, in a way, a faster way than if you were to just have like a hole at the bottom. It pulls the water out using gravity and atmospheric pressure. Um, and in general, a good rule of thumb is that the siphon piping should have a larger diameter than the piping bringing the water into the uh, grow bed. And this is just to make sure that your flow rates don't get uh, all kinds of mucked up because if you're getting water in faster then the siphon can take it out, then you've got an issue. <laughs> um, so that was one type of siphon. Another type of siphon is a bell siphon. And with this, I have a little kind of GIF video uh, at the bottom of the screen. And if you watch that, you can kind of see better how siphons work, um, just in that the water gets drained out faster than it can be poured in. And then the siphon kind of breaks at the bottom uh, when air bubbles get into the system. Um, and for this, you're gonna wanna have the siphon, the top part of the siphon be about one to two inches below the media. Uh, so you don't promote algae and bacteria growth with the, uh, with the sun and then the uh, damp bio balls or hydrogen, it can cause algae and bacteria growth. Uh, yes, so that's siphons. Um, another thing to consider in building an aquaponic system is being able to choose the right sort of water pump. 
And this is important, especially in terms of efficiency of your system. Uh, one of the main principles working with aquaponics is trying to be more sustainable um, and efficient in how we grow crops. Um, so in general, um, you wanna look for a pump that can pump the entire water volume of the tank in about two hours. So if the system is about 10 gallons, the pump should support a rate of five gallons per hour. Uh, in addition to this, the pump choice should also take into consideration um, how far the pump is pumping. Um, and we look at this in terms of the head height, which is the difference in height between the fish tank and then the grow bed. And it's a good way to have it in an aquaponic system where you have the fish tank below the grow bed. Um, and in this sense, you only have to use one water pump as opposed to multiple, and then you can just drain the water back from the grow bed into the fish tank. Um, and this is again, looking at the efficiency of the system and being able to kind of control that a little bit more. Um, but so one way also to be efficient is to minimize the head height between the fish tank and the grow bed. Um, just so in that way you can get a pump that's more suited for your system. Um, and here I just have a little infographic. Um, this is gonna come up when you're looking at choosing your pump. Um, most pumps should have something like this to look at. It's just a graph that compares the gallons per hours and then the head height and feet on the y-axis. And so if I had a system that uh, I needed it to be pumping at 400 gallons per hour. And then I wanted say uh, four, I had it four feet head height between the tank and the plant bed. Then I would be looking more at this light blue line, which in this case is uh, associated with AAPW 550. Um, but then if I had a system that had um, a larger difference in height between the um, two tanks, then I would be looking something more, if it was about eight feet, I would be looking at a higher powered pump uh, over at this purple line, um, AAPW 800 in this case. Um, but that's just something to think about when choosing your pump. And now Ben's gonna take back over to talk more about the uh, ecology part of the system. All right, hello everyone again. Um, so as many of you are probably aware, there is a natural cycle called the nitrogen cycle that is very prevalent in the soil, in our gardens, and basically everywhere in the natural ecosystem. And paired with this, we have to make sure that our fish waste is properly going through the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so it comes out as nutrients for plants rather than ammonia, which will cause harm. So before we talk about that, I want to talk about the water you'd be putting in your system. So anyone here that may have kept fish before is probably aware that tap water in cities is treated with chlorine and that it's very, very dangerous to fish. So it can be either evaporated off by leaving water out to make distilled water, or you can add the chlorinators, which I'm sure people are familiar with from aquarium keeping and dechlorinators can be gotten from any pond store or pet store really. Now back to the nitrogen cycle. Once you get that water in there, you need to make sure the fish waste and food waste is properly being uh, processed. And that is done by starting off bacterial colonies. Now there are two kinds of cycling you can do in your system or a fish tank, basically same idea. Um, there's fish in and fish less. So fish in, you add the bacteria that converts the ammonia into the plant nutrients. Then you add a fish and the fish serves as a natural source of ammonia by doing his business, eating, you know, just living his life. And eventually once the ammonia uh, lowers down to zero and your nitrates and nitrites are higher and at a stable level, you add more fish because the bacterial colony has been stabilized. Uh, fish list cycling is safer for the fish 
you add the bacteria, you add ammonia, just as you'd find in your kitchen, albeit a small amount, uh, don't wanna <laughs> drench them, but that ammonia you're adding serves as the natural food source now. And then once again, the ammonia drops and your plant nutrients stabilize, you can then add fish to the system. And like I said, ammonia in your system is very dangerous for the fish. It burns their gills. It makes them unable to breathe. It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. So this is a very, very important part of setting up your system. And this is just an example showing how that process works, how the nitrogen is moving through that cycle, being used by the plants and being produced by the fish. Uh, and then last slide here, uh, plant bed media. So a very common choice on the left is hydrotin. These are expanded clay balls that they hold the moisture very well. These provide excellent structure for roots, so I really like them. But a downside for these is they can be expensive. So if you're making a large system, like Brianna said, you're probably not going to get a media system because you'd have to just buy that much media. Uh, another common choice for sprouting plants and both growing them is coconut fibers. Uh, benefit of this is they're also biodegradable. And the plant seeds themselves are usually sprouted in rock wool. Some of you may have used this to sprout your own seeds. Um, it's not very biodegradable, but it's very useful in that it retains moisture and helps those seeds uh, start growing. Now, any questions? I see someone asked a question in chat. Um, I will read that now. Yeah, I know we had a question, I'm sure you're reading it right now, about the NFT system, about how you get your roots. Um, how do you get the, okay. the roots when you first start? And that's a good question. So something interesting about aquaponics compared to you know traditional gardening is once you get your plant sprouted, and once you get it kind of stable and healthy in a relatively juvenile form, you can put it right in the soil and it'll start growing. However, in aquaponics, sometimes it's better to wait to put that plant in the system until it's a larger size so that it can fully take advantage of the large amount of nutrients there. So people will kind of hold back on plants and not put them into the system, kind of raise them in, you know, maybe a more traditional setting and then take them out of even soil actually wash the roots off and plants can actually adapt to that. It's harder, but especially for a younger plant, it would be relatively feasible. I know too, we had some other questions going on um, during the presentation. I was wondering if you could go back and kind of touch on those as far as like where to get some of the supplies like bio balls were initially. Yeah, yeah. And where's the source so, for some of these things? Actually, do you want to hit the next slide, Brianna? So this is a bunch of links we compiled. Uh, we can share this PowerPoint with someone here uh, so they can you know, spread it around. Uh, and these are some you know, sources for some of the questions you might have after we're not here. But to the bio balls question, um, they're pretty, they pretty staple for any pond aquarium. So anywhere you can buy supplies for those two things, they'll probably have a form of them. Now, the most common form is those blue ones you've seen. That's kind of like the, the traditional, as, as you'd say, but you know, this brand makes a bio ball that is white and has different colored spikes. It accomplishes the same exact thing, it's just white. You know that, so you can buy all sorts of different kinds as long as they have that structure, but they should be available at any pet store, any pond store. I saw someone responded with a pond store. Um, a favorite source of mine for any fish supplies online is Dr. Foster's and Smith. And they are a fantastic source for basically anything you might need for an aquarium. And if you're interested in setting up a system, anything that might kind of breach those two areas. We also had a question on grow lights, particularly in the winter. Is that something that we need to consider, consider with a system like this or? I'd say absolutely. And that is an unfortunate part of being in you know, Michigan. Um, 
And it all, it also depends on how many plants you're growing. If you have a very full system, you're definitely going to want to add light. In my experience, the biggest control was the light I put on the system. So even if you might not need it, if you have the system by a window, you'll definitely get considerable more growth because you have the water and I take nutrient measurements. You know, my nitrate was definitely present. I'd have 80 parts per million and the plants were just rocketing. I changed the light from like this little dinky one you might put on your desk to a 300 watt. I cannot describe to you in two, three weeks, how this plant exploded. So I definitely say in winter time, a light would be a good investment. Um, maybe you might already have one, but yes, light is definitely the largest control. And I'd say big factor in aquaponics there. Oh, um, well, sorry. Go, go ahead and, and continue. Um, if there's anything more you need to add? Well, I just saw the new question, uh, how often did I add water? Um, once a week, maybe? Once, once a week, it, it depended how much water was, you know, in, in the system, but I'd say on average, that's how often. And it was only maybe a few gallons. We did have a question previously about um, type of fish that you use. Is it possible to get dinner off of one of these systems? I mean, can oh. you fish that are that big? Or are you kind of confined as a home gardener to goldfish and the like? I mean, I will say you can find examples out there of people who have set up, you know, ponds that are basically aquaponic systems and they grow fish they eat. So it's all dependent upon how much money, time, and space you have, to be honest. You could set up a system that grows tilapia in your basement with grow lights, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> and it's also going to be pretty massive because tilapia grow, you know, a foot long. You got to take into account how much space does that fish need to actually grow? Does it smell? Not, not that bad, to be completely honest. As far as uh, what about the ratio between how much water and how many fish? In, in typical system? Where so there's a really good rule of thumb in aquarium uh, keeping called one inch of fish per one gallon. Now you can kind of fudge this, especially in a commercial setting when you have heavy filtration. Um, but for a smaller system, I'd say one inch per gallon is great. So if you have, let's say you're setting up a system above a 10 gallon tank, two or three goldfish they'll produce plenty of waste, surprisingly. You'd be amazed. Goldfish are dirty, dirty, dirty fish. And then you started to, uh, on the chat, you made some comments as far as growing herbs. Is there certain herbs that are better for an aquaponic system? Yes, much yes, 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 yes. Um, I had a lot of success with basil because it's, in my experience, it is less picky about its water. So some people may disagree, but personally, in my experience with growing basil, it was less picky about that. I tried rosemary. Rosemary was not happy about going in the barrel. So there is definitely uh, give and take between the kinds of things you're growing. And another thing to take into account is, as Brianna was talking about with the siphons, you can change how much water is in the system, how long the water stays there. So if you want to grow rosemary, you could design a specific system to grow rosemary by having less water stay there or like a lower water level. So I'd say, yes, any water loving herbs or less ones that have uh, no problem with being overwatered are the herbs you definitely want to go towards. Are there any other I know we mainly can focus on food, so obviously vegetables and all that, but is there certain crops that you seem to be more successful with versus less successful? I know you've mentioned lettuce a couple of times. But okay. Things? There are, and that's an awesome. I just saw this question in chat. I really want to share a picture with all of you. I, it's one of my favorite aquaponics pictures, um, and it's about strawberries. 
people have had a large amount of success growing aquaponic strawberries just because of the large amount of nutrients the plants take. So I'm going to share my screen. Do you want me to stop sharing, Ben? Yeah. So this is just some of the examples of the systems people have come up with to grow strawberries. Um, here's an example of one, and it, they're really, I think, I'm gonna say it, they're cute because they kind of dangle over the pipes after you plant them in. So yes, there's many examples of larger plants being grown um, in aquaponic systems like strawberries, you know, nice crops like that. Tomatoes are actually a really, really common plant in aquaponics. They are kind of, I'd say, one of the staples. So if you are a big fan of tomatoes, this is a great way to grow them. I would just put in, if you're looking to grow a bigger plant like a tomato plant, um, to definitely look into the media of its system. Um, I don't think a tomato plant would do super great in like a NFT system as much. Yeah, because they need the support. I, that's a, yeah, that's a huge thing for them. Any luck with green beans or? Personally, no, I've not grown green beans. I can, that's one I don't know if people have grown. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> you, you pick the vegetable. I don't. <laughs> And then there's a question too, if you could go over the ammonia issue again, as far as the balance and how that works in the aquaponic system. Okay, yeah, of course. Um, so basically any sort of organic matter, whether it be a leaf, fish poop, fish food, the, anything, a dead fish, once it you know, settles to the bottom in a lake or a river, it's going to start decomposing. And one of the initial products that is given off when anything decomposes is ammonia. And in our aquaponic systems, that ammonia has nowhere to go like it does in the lake. A lake is a huge system with many working different factors, but in an aquaponic system, we have to recreate that lake. You know, we have to make what's naturally processing those compounds and that organic matter exists in our system. So when that ammonia is created from the fish waste being produced from the fish eating and just living their lives, and you know, if you give them in a little extra food, some goes to the bottom and starts decomposing, that's gonna turn into ammonia and it would build up if you don't have those bacteria that eat it and basically turn it into other things that don't hurt the fish as much, like not nearly as much. Did anybody else have any questions? You can feel free to use chat, or if you want to just go ahead and unmute your mic, feel free to ask at this time. Um, if you have anything else to add, this is your opportunity. And do you find too that you, you know, you usually are using goldfish just because they're easier to come by, or is there other things that are, I remember those like, Peace lilies with a beta fish in the bottom, but do, do you ever use like those yeah. in the aquaponic system? I mean, it sounds like a system where kinda. So personally, I've had ideas about using other fish. Um, there's these little guys called white cloud tetras. Uh, mm -hmm. They're about an inch long. They're very cold hardy. Um, and I've had a, if I ever make a you know, small system, like a five gallon fish tank, I'm definitely going to use those. Uh, but the reason we have chosen goldfish is they're inexpensive, they're available everywhere, they have amazing temperature tolerance. You know, you see them, you see people putting them in ponds, but you see them, people putting them in heated fish tanks. They can live in basically anything, you know, and if you get the right species of goldfish, they stay a relatively small size. So it's just a combination of factors that make them kind of really ideal for these smaller home systems. And then it's kind of along the same lines, what's the general care of the fish once they're in the system? So if you've ever kept a fish tank or anything like that, it's kind of the same idea, except less water changes. So that's awesome. Um, feed the fish every day, twice a day, if you have the time. Um, 
if not, you know, once larger meal. Make sure they're probably check up on them every day. Make sure they're not any, you know, fish illnesses like ick or velvet. I'm a big fish nerd, so I, I know all these words and things. Um, and then that's pretty much it. I mean, fish are one of the easier pets out there. And, you know, now that you're using their waste products for the plants, I, I will say something about testing your water. If you got one of these systems, you definitely want to test your water probably once a week. And a test kit can be gotten from any pet store. Um, relatively inexpensively and that'll just tell you what's going on in the system you know how much ammonia do I have how much nitrate how much nitrate you know and if you keep a log of that you'll be able to tell if something goes wrong and then oh no my fish died or something sick or my plants don't look good let me look at my log boom 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 oh this changed hey I'm not sure if I understand this question, but how much space for an 18 gallon fish tank approximately with goldfish in the tank? I don't know, so Shelly, I, if you want to unmute yourself and chime in on that one, go for it. If that makes any sense to you. Then. I'll be honest, I've never seen an 18 gallon fish tank anywhere. However, I have seen 20s and if I was to make an aquaponics system out of one, I'd use a 20 long for the surface area. And they're about maybe two feet long by 12 inches wide by a foot tall and then but then you need to factor in your plant bed as well so that's just the aquarium size <laughs> but not big not 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 big and is there a, a good design in your sources maybe that would be good for a beginner for like a basement system nothing too big for starting for a basement out system. Um, there's a good link. Um, I think it's the first link um, to a site called Backyard Aquaponics, I think. And it's a kind of huge database just of systems that people have built and they kind of go through and they talk through their plans um, and like troubleshooting. Um, and that's a really great source to look at if you're not sure what you want to build. Um, personally, for a beginner, I would recommend a media bed system um, as my personal choice. Um, it's just an easier system to work with in terms of you don't have to deal with the PVC piping and like cutting out spaces for plants. Um, and it's kind of a similar system to like soil where you can just put the plant in. And as long as you have your water flow going in an effective way, it's a relatively easy system to work with. And then also I had a question, if somebody starts a system, do you or your organization, can you come out and help set it up or troubleshoot any problems? Anything along those lines? Are you available to we, the public? <laughs> we could definitely troubleshoot. We have no problem with that. Um, that would be awesome. Uh, but coming out and helping set it up, well, right now, we're not even allowed to meet ourselves because of the whole pandemic non fun times yay anyway <laughs> um so unfortunately we probably can't help you right now but we could you know maybe help you design and definitely if you design a system and you run into any problems please let us know we would love to you know get updates that would be so cool if we gave this presentation and we got a bunch of pictures that hey I made one <laughs> <laughs> and then if there's anybody else that had any comments or questions for for Ben and Brianna um, I'll ask the question uh, how often do you um, refresh the soil and what do you use as a soil mass in the plant area Or is it just the plant and the and the roots? Yeah, it's just the plant and the roots. That's the thing. Okay. So you don't have to bother with soil going sour or anything like that. No, that's a huge benefit actually. Um, 
like Brianna talked about earlier, there is sometimes a problem with like solid waste buildup. And I think that's kind of the closest thing you'd run into. But in a media bed system, you could clean that out or something I've been looking into. And this is really interesting. This is kind of <laughs> high level aquaponics. They're these red worms. They're very aquatic. And people will add these worms to the system and they will eat that organic matter. Just like, you know, a traditional garden. Right. Yeah, red worms are <laughs> really Trojan horses. I mean, they work hard. Good, well, thank you. No problem, thank you. And did anybody else have any last minute questions? If not, um, you can put this down for an hour's worth of education under food, general gardens. And Ben and Brianna, I want to thank you so much for such an interesting presentation and a different way to think about growing our food that is definitely out of the box for a lot of us. Thank yeah, you so much I, for your time. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you all for having us. Thank you for coming. Yes. Mm -hmm. With that, I'll okay. conclude the meeting and let you guys go. And thank you so much. Thanks, okay. Ben and Brianna. That was really fun to listen to. Thank you. Uh -huh. Glad you enjoyed it. Makes me think I need a new aquarium. I had tons of them when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> They're very fun. I think that's one of my favorite parts about aquaponics is getting to interact with the fish a little bit as well as the plants. My neighbor and I used to fig used to try to figure out how long each goldfish had lived. I think we had one that went 10 years. It'd be inside during the winter and in his pond in the summer. The record lifespan for a goldfish, I believe, is 18 years. So they, wow. they can live quite a long time. Thanks again, Amanda, for setting this up. Good night, everybody. Good night, Julie. Good night, Amanda. Good night, everybody.